Hello everyone. Today we shall be discussing the solutions to the week 5 assignment questions. Before start, uh, starting with the questions, it would be beneficial if we review the concepts of uh, discrete Fourier transform and quantum Fourier transform. So let us first uh, revise what, discrete, what a discrete Fourier transform does. Like the continuous Fourier transform and the continuous Laplace transform, or in fact any transform, the discrete Fourier transform con converts one function into another. But instead of having a continuous function, here we have a discrete function. So before looking at the quantum Fourier transform, let's look at the discrete Fourier transform. So a discrete Fourier transform transforms a discrete function, say f, to another discrete function g. And the inputs to these could be, say, um, from 0 to n minus 1, which are n inputs. And the function g will also contain n inputs. That is uh, f of i, where i can take the values 0 to n minus 1. Now let us take n to be 2 raised to n, where n is a natural number. And instead of using this notation, we can use ai. And instead of using g of i, we can use the notation b of i. So uh, we have a transform which converts all ais into some bj's, where i, I can take the values 0 to n minus 1, and j can take the values 0 to n minus 1. So this is what a discrete Fourier transform is supposed to do. Now, how do you get bj's when you have been given ais? So the formula which defines the discrete Fourier transform is bj is equal to 1 upon root n times summation of i going from 0 to n minus 1 times e raise to 2 pi i times j times i, where i denotes the imaginary component i upon n times a of i. So suppose e raise to 2 pi i j, sorry, uh, e raise to 2 pi i upon n is denoted by omega. Here i is the imaginary uh, i. So if we denote this by i, we get b of j is equal to 1 upon root n summation of i going from 0 to n minus 1, omega raise to ij ai. Now, th uh, now this can be represented in a much simpler manner by using matrices. So bj can be represented using a matrix, using a, a column uh, vector that is b0, b1 till bn, bn minus 1. And this should be equal to 1 upon root n times omega raised to 0 into 0, because this is the 0, 0 element. Then omega raised to 0 dot to 1, 0 into 1, which is again 0, omega raised to 0, 2, and so on till omega raised to 0, n. The second row would be omega raised to 1 into 0, omega raised to 1 into 1, omega raised to 1 into 2, till omega raised to 1 into n, and so on. And the last element would be, oh, sorry, this should be n minus 1, n minus 1. And the last element would be omega raised to n minus 1 whole square. So this matrix, you multiply it by the matrix A, A0, A1, till A n minus 1. So this is how we calculate a discrete Fourier transform. Now, where does this come in uh, while calculating the quantum Fourier transform? So let us consider uh, that we have been given a state psi, and it is a combination of some um, some states i, some basis states i, which are orthogonal to each, to each other. So here I I will go from zero to n minus 1, where n is equal to 2 raised to n. So this can be, this is represented as a column vector a0, a1 till a n minus 1. 
and when we take the quantum fourier transform let's say let's call it phi which is equal to u times quantum fourier transform of psi then the matrix elements of phi will be given by b0 till bn minus 1 using the same formula that we used before so this can be written more compactly as this going to here again i and i and j represent this i and this j and the i outside is the imaginary i this is exactly the same quant uh, same number here which goes along with j which we would have found out using the matrix notation which can be which you could verify for yourself so uh, let us let us now look at the questions so question 1 is the quantum fourier transform of 0 minus 1 upon root 2 is so this is a one qubit state so here small n is equal to 1 capital n is equal to 2 which is equal to 2 raised to 1 and what would the matrix look like the matrix would be given by uh, u is equal to 1 upon root of n times omega is to 0 omega is to 0 omega is to 0 and omega is to 1 dot 1 which is 1 upon root 2 times 1 1 1, 1 omega now omega is given by e is to 2 pi i upon 2 is to n here 2 is to n is just 2 so this is e is to pi i which is minus 1 so we get u qft the operator corresponding to the quantum fourier transform to be 1 upon root 2 times 1 1 1 minus 1 now this is simply the hadamard gate and this was discussed in the lecture as well so the uh, operator corresponding to the quantum fourier transform for a one qubit state is the same as the hadamard gate the state which has been given to us is psi is equal to 0 minus 1 upon root 2 so the quantum fourier transform of this will just be the hadamard gate applied on this which would be 1 upon root 2 times 1 1 1 minus 1 times 1 upon root 2 minus 1 upon root 2 and this is simply 0 1 which is a state 1 so the correct answer is option b now let's look at a more complicated question which is question 2 here we have been given an n qubit state where n is not necessarily 1 and the state which has been given to us is psi is equal to root 2 upon n summation over x is equal to 0 to n minus 1 cos of 2 pi x upon n times x. The QFT of some state, say alpha, which is given by summation a i times i, with which has been normalized, of course. The quantum Fourier transform of this will be given by. summation ai uh, two summations summations over i and j ai e raised to 2 pi i j times i upon n times j upon root n so so here ai's will be replaced by cos of 2 pi x upon n 
and applying applying this formula what we should uh, what we would get is quantum fourier transform of psi should be equal to root 2 upon n times 1 upon root n summation over y is equal to 0 to n minus 1 summation over x is equal to 0 to n minus 1 of cos of 2 pi x upon n into e raised to 2 pi x y i upon n times the ket y. Now let us just look at the uh, quantity inside the bracket, the coefficient of uh, the, sta the state y. So the coefficient is root 2 upon n times 1 upon n times cos of 2 pi x upon n times e raised to 2 pi x y i upon n. So this is the coefficient of the state y and a summation over x for x going from 1 to n to minus 1. So this is the coefficient of the state y. So we need to simplify this to get to the answer. So this is equal to summation over uh, x root 2 upon n. Now cos can be expanded as uh, summation of two exponentials. So the cos term is, is e raised to 2 pi x i upon n plus e raised to minus 2 pi x i upon n upon 2. This is same as root 2 upon n summation over x going from 0 to n minus 1 e raised to this is x y and this is just x. So we will get 2 pi y x plus 1 i upon n and the second term would be e raised to 2 pi um, sorry I made a mistake here this should be 2 pi x y plus 1 and here it should be 2 pi x y minus 1 i upon n upon 2. Now let us look at the sum of the sum summation in the first term. So the first term summation would be let us call it s1. s1 would be x going from 0 to n minus 1 e raised to 2 pi x y plus 1 i upon n. Now x is the quantity which is varying while y is the quantity which we have fixed since we want to find out the coefficient for ket y. So let us say y is equal to n minus 1. If y is equal to n minus 1 then s1 will become summation x is equal to 0 to n minus 1 times e raised to 2 pi x n i upon n. So we get e raised to 2 pi x i and x is an integer going from uh, taking value 0 to n minus 1. So each of these terms inside the summation is equal to 1 and we get summation over 1 which is equal to n since there are n terms. So if y is equal to n minus 1 the first term will give n. Now let us see what happens to the first term when y is not equal to n minus 1. So when y is not equal to n minus 1, the first term, which uh, the first summation is equal to 0 to n minus 1 e raised to 2 pi y plus 1 x i upon n. Now this is clearly the, the sum of a geometric series. So this should be given by 1 minus r raised to n upon 1 minus r, where r is the uh, ratio in the uh, geometric series uh, and the ratio is e raised to 2 pi y plus 1 i upon n. So this is given by 1 minus e raised to 2 pi y plus 1 i. This is the ratio sorry upon n times n upon 1 minus e raised to 2 pi y plus 1 
i by n. Now clearly the numerator is 0. It is 0 because the second term is e raised to 2 pi y plus 1 i, the n cancel each other out. So this is e raised to a, uh, an integer multiple of 2 pi which is 1. So the numerator is 0, hence this is 0. So the first summation is equal to n when y is equal to n minus 1 and it is equal to 0 when y is not equal to n minus 1. Now we can do the same calculation for the second term and what we will get is that the, uh, the second summation should be equal to 1 when uh, y is equal to 1 and it should be 0 when y is not equal to 1 for any y not equal to 1. So let us do that calculation. So the, se the second summation was x equal to 0 to n minus 1 times uh, uh, summation of 2 pi x y minus 1 i upon n. So for y equal to 1, s2 is trivially n, which you can observe directly. y is equal to 1 would imply uh, that each term inside the summation would be e raised to 2 pi into 0 which is e raised to 0 which is 1. So that, that will give an n and when y is not equal to 1 then s2 would be 1 minus e raised to 2 pi y minus 1 i upon n bracket raised to n upon 1 minus e raised to 2 pi y minus 1 i upon n. Here again the numerator is 1 minus 1 which is 0. So s2 is equal to n when uh, y is equal to 1 and it is 0 when y is not equal to 1. So let us get back to the uh, uh, equation that was used before. So uh, we have c of y is equal to root 2 upon n summation uh, sorry s1 plus s2 upon 2 where s1 and s2 are, are, are the summations that we had used before. So this, this is equal to root 2 upon n times um, summation 1 was 0 when n was not equal to uh, sorry when, I, uh, when y was not equal to n minus 1 and summation 1 was equal to n when y was equal to n minus 1. Also s2, this is for s1 and s2 was 0 when y was not equal to 1 and it was n when y was equal to 1. So this is clearly root 2 upon n times n, but n will, uh, n will occur only when y is either equal to n minus 1 or 1 and it would be 0 if y were neither of these. So what we get is cy is equal to Mm, there is an error in the coefficient. So cy should be equal to 1 upon root 2 times delta y comma 1 plus delta y comma n minus 1. Therefore the quantum Fourier transform of the given state would be 1 upon root 2 times 1 plus n minus 1. So the correct answer is option B. Question 3 is similar to question 2. Here instead of having a t, uh, the cosine, cosine as the coefficient we have sine of 2 pi x by n. So in question 3 
psi is equal to root 2 upon n summation over x is equal to 0 to n minus 1 sin of 2 pi x upon n times x. So the quantum Fourier transform of this would be root 2 upon n into 1 upon root n summation over y going from 0 to n minus 1 summation over x going from 0 to n minus 1 times sine of 2 pi x upon n e raised to 2 pi x y i upon n times y. So the coefficient of y is root 2 upon n summation over x going from 1 to n minus 1 sin of 2 pi x upon n times e raised to 2 pi x y i upon n. Now here again we can expand sin of 2 pi x upon n as exponential minus exponential upon 2 i. So this should give root 2 upon n summation over x e raised to 2 pi x i upon n minus e raised to 2 pi x i upon n upon 2 i times e raised to 2 pi x y i upon n. Simplifying this further, what we get is C y is equal to 1 upon root 2 n i summation over e raised to 2 pi x y plus 1 i upon n minus e raised to 2 pi x sorry uh, in, in the previous slide in the previous uh, page this should have been e raised to minus 2 pi x i upon n. So here we get y minus 1 i upon n. Now following the same procedure uh, as last time the first summation should give 0 and n. 0 when y is not equal to n minus 1 and n when y is equal to equal to n minus 1 and the second term should give 0 when y is not equal to 1 and n when y is equal to n minus 1 uh, sorry when y is equal to 1. So the coefficient of y is equal to 1 upon root 2 times i when y is equal to 1 it is minus of 1 upon root 2 i when y is equal to n minus 1 and it is equal to 0 in any other case. Now the factor of i does not matter because while normalizing any phase factor any overall phase factor does not matter. So the answer which we get is 1 upon root 2 times 1 minus n minus 1 which corresponds to option B. So option B is the correct answer. Let us come to question 4. Question 4 is again similar to the two previous problems. So question 4 is what is the quantum Fourier transform of the state given by root 2 upon n Now again on doing the quantum Fourier transform the coefficient of y would be given by root 2 upon n times 1 upon root n summation over x going from 0 to n minus 1 cos of 4 pi x upon n times e raised to 2 pi i x y upon n. Now this the cos term can be expanded as e raised to 2 pi times 2x upon n plus times i of course plus e raised to 2 pi times 
2 x i upon n upon 2 and we multiply this by e raised to 2 pi i x y upon n summation over x. So, this is equal to 1 upon root 2 times n summation over x 0 to n minus 1 e raised to 2 pi x times y plus 2 i upon n plus e raised to 2 pi x times y minus 2 i upon n. So, um, one can observe that this th the first summation should give uh, 0 and n, n only when y is equal to n minus 2 and 0 when y is not equal to n minus 2. And while the second summation should give n when y is equal to 2 and it should give 0 when y is not equal to 2. Thus, we get we get that the coefficient of y is equal to 1 upon root 2 if and only if y is equal to 2 or n minus 2. Therefore, therefore, the quantum Fourier transform of the given state is equal to 1 upon root 2 times 2 plus n minus 2. So, option D is the correct answer. Now, question 5 again is about the quantum Fourier transform. So, a state given by a state 0 0 plus 0 1 upon root 2 is subjected to quantum Fourier transform after which the first qubit is measured. The probability of getting the state 0 is what? So, let us solve this question. So, the given state which we shall call psi is 0 0 plus 0 1 upon root 2. So, we have to operate a quantum Fourier transform gate on this on both on both the qubits. So, this is actually equal to 0 plus 1 upon root 2. So, here we have n is equal to 2 and capital N is equal to 2 square is equal to 4. So, the coefficient of any state y where y can go from 0 to 3, 0, 1, 2 and 3. So, c of y will be given by summation over x going from 0 to 3 of a uh, times a x times e raise to 2 pi i x y upon 4. This is the coefficient. So, c of y is equal to summation over for y equal to 0 c of 0 is equal to summation x is equal to 0 to 3 a x e raise to 2 pi i x into 0 upon 4 which is summation over a x x is equal to 0 to 3 and we have to divide this by root 4 which is 2. So, the coefficient of the state 0 0 meaning the state 0 0 So, the coefficient of this state c 0 is equal to summation a x upon 2 which is a 0 plus a 1 plus a 2 plus a 3 upon 2. Now, a 0 and a 1 are 1 upon root 2 and 1 upon root 2 each. So, we have 1 upon root 2 plus 1 upon root 2 plus 0 plus 0 upon which is 1 upon root 2. Now, the question asks what is the probability of getting the state 0, but the state 0 is the state 0 for the first qubit. So, we need to look at the state uh, the coefficient of the state 0 1 which is the only other state which has 0 in, in its first qubit place. So, this corresponds to the state C 1.
So, the coefficient of the state 1 would be given by summation over x going from 0 to 3 a x e raised to 2 pi x times 1 upon 2 upon 4. So, this cancels out to give 1 by 2 and we get summation x is equal to 0 to 3 a x e raised to pi x upon 2. So, this sh this will give a 0 e raised to 0 plus a 1 e raised to pi by 2 pi by 2 i this there should be an i everywhere plus 0 plus 0. So, this is 1 upon root 2 and the second term is 1 upon root 2 times i. So, the coefficient of 0 which is equal to the equal to the coefficient of uh, this the ket 0 0 is equal to one was 1 by root 2 and the coefficient of the state 0 1 which is, is same as this is the coefficient of the state 1 is equal to 1 upon root 2 times 1 plus i. Now, in using this formula rather than using the formula for any y the state that we had got, uh, gotten was already normalized. So, all we need to do to find out the probability of getting the state of measuring the state 0 in the first qubit is to take the, uh, abs the sum of the absolute squares of these two. So, the probability of q 1 being measured to be get uh, being measured to be 0 is equal to mod of c 0 square plus mod of c 1 square and that is 1 upon root 2 whole square plus 1 upon root 2 1 plus i whole square and this is this is just 3 upon 4. So, the answer is option C. Now, let us solve question 6. Question 6 again asks us, asks us to find the Fourier transform of uh, a state. So, the given state is 1 upon 2 times 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3. It would be reasonable to assume here that the question is dealing with a 2 qubit state where a small n is equal to 2 and capital N is equal to 4. So, we get states going from 0 to n minus 1 that is 0 to 3. So, to get the uh, QFT of this we can find out the coefficient term by term that is coefficient of each of the uh, basis gets. In, in the Fourier transform of this. So, the coefficient of the state y uh, sorry uh, the coefficient of the kate y that is would be given by summation over x going from 0 to 3 a x e raise to 2 pi x y i upon n times 1 upon root n. Here uh, n is equal to 4. So, let us look at the coefficient of the state 0. So, c 0 is summation over x a x e raised to 2 pi x times 0 i upon 4 upon 2. Now, the numerator is always 1 irrespective of what value x takes. So, this is summation of a x upon 2 0 to 3. So, this is just 1 upon 2 plus 1 upon 2 plus 1 upon 2 plus 1 upon 2 upon 2. So, the numerator is 2 and the denominator is 2. So, we get the coefficient of 0 to be 1. Now, the quantum Fourier transform formula that we have used always gives uh, the normalized uh, Fourier transform. So, if the coefficient of the state 0 is 1, the coefficients of all other states in of the Fourier transform should be 0. So, so we have C 0 equal to 1 and C 1 equal to C 2 equal to C 3 equal to 0. So, 
C0 equal to 1 implies C1 equal to C2. So, what we have is the only the get 0. So, the Fourier transform of psi gives us the state uh, gives us the get 0. So, the correct answer is option A. So, question 7 asks what is the period of 11 mod 15? So, the period of any integer uh, any uh, positive integer m mod any natural number n is equal to the smallest p greater than 0 which satisfies m raised to p mod n is equal to 1. In this case we have 11 raised to 0 mod 15 is of course 1 mod 15 which is 1 but we need p greater than 0. So, 11 let us look at the next integer 11 raised to 1 mod 15 is equal to 11 mod 15 which is 11. 11 square mod 15 is 121 mod 15 which is 1 because 120 is a multiple of 15. So, what we are left after dividing 121 by 15 is the remainder 1. So, clearly 2 is the smallest integer which satisfies this condition. So, the period of 11 mod 15 is 2 which is option A. So, option A is the correct option. Now, let us look at question 8. So, question 8 asks how many B J K gates are required for implementing the quantum Fourier transform of a L qubit register. Before solving this question, it would be beneficial if we look at the next question because when we while solving for a 3 qubit register, which is what the next question asks us to do, uh, we can find out we can recognize a pattern in the number of uh, B J K gates that are required for an N qubit uh, quantum Fourier transform. So, let us look at question 9 first. Question 9 asks the order in which the elementary gates are applied in implementing the quantum Fourier transform on a 4 qubit register after the swap operation which relabels the qubits are as follows. Here B J K represents gate applied on the jth qubit with kth qubit as control and H i represents a Hadamard gate applied on the ith qubit. Let us first write down the uh, uh, draw the circuit diagram for the quantum Fourier transform of the of a 4 qubit register. So, let us call the 4 qubits x 0, x 1, x 2 and x 3. So, the first thing we do is to apply a swap operation. So, what the swap operation does is uh, it, ge it gives x 3 here, x 2 here, x 1 here and x 0 here, but the question specifically says that the relabeling has been done. So, even after the swap, swap operation has been done, this will be referred to as x 0, this as x 1, this as x 2 and this as x 3. Now, the first uh, operation, the first gate which is applied is the Hadamard gate on the first qubit h 0. The second is a phase gate applied on the x 0 bit where x 1 bit is the control bit. Now, let us look at the question. The question says that the B J K represents a gate applied on the jth qubit with uh, the kth qubit as the control bit. So, B J K is applied on jth qubit. and k is the control bit. So, here uh, we, we are going to apply the B J K gate which is applied to the 0th qubit and with 1 as its control bit. So, we have B 0 1. Next is B 0 2 
here 2 is the control bit. And last we have B03. These are all the operations which which are done on the x0 qubit. So next the next part the next part of the algorithm involves only x1, x2 and x3. So we have again the Hadamard gate followed by B23, uh, sorry B12. and then B13. These are all the operations that are done, uh, done on the x1 qubit. The next part is on x2 and x3. When no operation is being done on, when I say no operations have been done on x0 and x1, henceforth will be done henceforth. It means x0 and x1 will just continue as they are. So there will be an x1 line and an x0 line on which no changes will, will, will have been done in this part. So on x2 we have the Hadamard gate and the phase gate. And x2 will continue as it as it is henceforth. And on x3 the only a uh, gate which is applied is H3, the Hadamard gate on the third qubit. So we have these four lines which are the outputs. So let's look at the sequence in which the operators have been applied. So f uh, the first qubit, uh, the first uh, operator that was applied was H0. After that we applied B01, then B02, then B03. Next we applied operator H1 then B12, then B13. So we have in reverse order H1, B12, B13. Next we had H2, then B23. So this is H2 and B23. And the last is just H3. So what we have is H3 multiplied by B23 H2 multiplied by B13 B12 H1 multiplied by B03 B02 B01 H. Now this is same as option B in the in the question. So the correct answer is option B. Now, uh, going back to question 8, question a 8 asks how many BJK gates are required for implementing a QFT on a L qubit register. So let's look, let's first look at how many BJK, BJK qubits were used uh, in the ninth question for a 4 qubit register. In the 4 qubit register, we observe that there are 4 brackets and the number of uh, BJK gates that are involved are 0, 1, for this there are 2 and for the last there are 3. Similarly, if you look at the QFT implementation, QFT circuit for a 3 qubit state, you will find that only 0, 1 and 2 gates appear uh, in the circuit. So for this is the, uh, this is the number of B, uh, BJK um, operators that occurred in a 4 qubit register. So uh, for a L qubit register, if we generalize, what we should get is 0 plus 1 plus 2 till L minus 1, which is just 1 plus 2 dot 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 till L minus 1. This is just the sum of the first L minus 1 natural numbers. 
and we can use the formula that summation over i for i going from 1 to n is n into n minus 1 upon 2 sorry n into n plus 1 upon 2 so here what we get is l minus 1 into l minus 1 plus 1 upon 2 which is l into l minus 1 upon 2 which is same as option a So the correct answer for question 8 is option A. Now let's look at question 10. Question 10 asks, in factorizing 77, 77 to illustrate Shor's algorithm, a co-prime co m is equal to 5 was chosen whose period was found to be 30. If we are using a, three, a 13 qubit register, the intensity of the sharp peaks would be how, how many percent? Percents. So we are factorizing 77 and we are using m is equal to 5. We are also using a 13 qubit register. So uh, going by the notation used in the lecture notes, Q is equal to 2 raised to 13 and M is equal to 5. The period P is equal to 30. As was discussed in the lecture, the, um, the intensity of the sharp peaks is given by M upon Q, where M is equal to M raised to P upon Q. So the intensity of the sharp peaks will be just 5 raised to 30 upon 2 raised to 13 into 2 raised to 13. And this approximately turns out to be 3.3 percent. So the correct answer is option C. Question 11 is the continued fraction representation of 61 upon 45 is what? So let's expand this in, a, in the continued fraction uh, notation. So 65 upon 45 should give you the, the quotient 1 and a remainder of 61 minus 45, which is 16. Now this is same as 1 plus 1 upon 45 upon 16, which is same as 1 plus 1 upon 2 plus uh, 16 to the 32. So we get the remainder 13, 13 upon 16. This is same as 1 plus 1 upon 2 plus 1 upon 16 plus 16 upon 13, which is same as 1 plus 1 upon 2 plus 1 upon 1 plus 3 upon 13. This is same as 1 upon 1 plus 2 upon 1 plus 1 upon 2 plus 1 upon 1 plus 13 upon 3. Thir now 13 upon 3 is same as 1 upon 13 upon 3 is same as 1 upon 3 fours are 12 plus 1 upon 3. So the continued fraction uh, representation would be 1, 2, 1, 4, 3. So we had 1, 2, 1, 4, 3. So the correct answer is option A. So the last question is, in, in using Shor's algorithm for n equal to 21, which of the following numbers m may be used for de determining the period of m raised to a. Now, th uh, the first step of the Shor's, alg Shor's algorithm involves choosing a random m, a random, in a random natural number m, and trying to see if m and n are co-primes. So if m and n are co-primes, then we proceed to finding the peri period of n mod m. 
So the only thing here which we need to check is whether m is a coprime, uh, whether m is coprime with n. That is, whether the GCD of m and n is equal to one. So um, from the given options, this is the number n. The given options are two, three, four, and five. Now clearly, two, four, and five are coprime with twenty-one, while three is a, a factor of twenty-one. So this cannot be used as m, while these three can be used as m. So the the correct answer is options A, C, and D. So these three can be used as m. Thank you.